It started with a simple case file on my desk, a missing persons report from Wausau, Wisconsin. The details were sparse. A young woman named Isabella Navarro had disappeared during a camping trip in the nearby Rib Mountain State Park. The usual paperwork didn't prepare me for the horror that was about to unfold. My name is Callum Whitaker, and I've been working for the missing persons unit for over a decade. It's a job that requires a certain detachment, but you can't help but get drawn into the lives of the missing. Their stories haunt you, each one a puzzle begging to be solved. Isabella's case seemed straightforward at first. She'd gone on a weekend trip with friends and never returned. Her friends reported that she wandered off alone around dusk and never came back. Local search teams combed the area but found no trace. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. I arrived in Wausau early, with a headache from the long drive. The town had a quaint charm, overshadowed by the grim task ahead. My first stop was the sheriff's office to meet with Deputy Sarah Lang, who had been leading the search efforts. Lang was a tall woman with a stern demeanor and eyes that looked like they hadn't seen sleep in days. She briefed me on the search. We've covered most of the park, but it's dense. People get lost out there all the time, but this one feels different. There's no trace of her. No footprints. No campsite disturbances. Nothing. I nodded, already feeling the weight of the mystery. Any witnesses? Unusual activity reported around the time she disappeared? Nothing concrete, Lang replied. Her friends said she was acting a bit strange before she disappeared, but they chalked it up to stress from work. She did leave her phone behind, which is odd for someone going for a walk alone. We decided to visit the campsite where Isabella was last seen. It was a typical site. A few tents, a fire pit, and the surrounding forest. Her friends, still camping there, were visibly shaken. She was just here, you know, said Liam, one of her friends, pointing to a spot near the fire pit. We thought she went to take a leak or something, but she didn't come back. We searched, called out, but nothing. I asked if she had been drinking or using any substances, trying to piece together any detail that might explain her disappearance. They all shook their heads. She was stone-cold sober, just tired and stressed, Liam insisted. As I walked around the site, I felt the eerie silence of the forest. It was too quiet, as if the woods were holding their breath. My gut told me there was more to this than a simple case of getting lost. We expanded the search area, bringing in more volunteers and using drones to scan from above. Days passed with no progress. The forest seemed to swallow our efforts, mocking our attempts to find Isabella. One evening, as the search was winding down, a scream pierced the air. We rushed towards the sound, flashlights cutting through the darkness. It was one of the volunteers, pale and trembling, pointing at something on the ground. There, half buried in the underbrush, was a severed hand. It was pale and lifeless, fingers curled as if grasping at nothing. The shock was palpable, but we quickly secured the area and called in the forensic team. The hand was confirmed to be Isabella's. The discovery changed everything. This was no longer a missing persons case. It was a murder investigation. The forest had given up its first gruesome secret, and I feared there were more to come. With renewed urgency, we intensified our search, focusing on the area around where the hand was found. It was then that we started noticing odd signs, claw marks on trees, deep grooves in the ground, and a strange musky odor that hung in the air. Late one night, while reviewing maps in my motel room, I got a call from Lang. Callum, you need to see this, she said, her voice shaking. We found something. Meet me at the search site. I drove to the site, the forest looming ominously in the moonlight. Lang led me to a clearing where a makeshift shrine had been discovered. It was a circle of stones, with small animal bones and trinkets arranged in a disturbing pattern. Who the hell would do this? I muttered feeling a chill run down my spine. Lang shook her head. I don't know, but it's not local. This... this is something else. We had the shrine photographed and dismantled, hoping to find clues in the objects. But all we got were more questions. The forensic team identified the bones as belonging to various small animals, but the arrangement suggested something ritualistic. Days turned into a week, and the forest continued to withhold its secrets. 
One night, while on patrol, I heard a rustling in the bushes. My flashlight caught a glimpse of something moving, a large, shadowy figure that disappeared almost as soon as I saw it. Lang, did you see that? I whispered into my radio. Yeah, something's out here with us, she replied, her voice tense. Stay sharp. We pressed on, the forest around us feeling increasingly alien and hostile. Then we stumbled upon a cave, hidden behind thick foliage. Inside, we found what appeared to be a lair. Bones littered the ground, and the walls were smeared with some dark, sticky substance. As we explored deeper into the cave, the smell grew more pungent. At the back, we found a large nest-like structure made of branches, leaves, and more bones. It was empty, but recent. What the hell lives here? Lang whispered, her face pale. I don't know, but it's not human, I replied, feeling the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. We retreated from the cave, marking it for further investigation. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The forest seemed alive, a malevolent presence that toyed with us. The following morning, another body was found, this time mutilated beyond recognition. It was a local hiker, reported missing a few days earlier. The pattern was clear now. Something was hunting in these woods, something far more dangerous than a bear or a wolf. We brought in specialists, including a cryptozoologist who theorized that we might be dealing with a previously unknown predator. It's intelligent, territorial, and it knows how to avoid detection, he explained. Whatever it is, it's not working alone. There's evidence of coordinated behavior suggesting a pack or a tribe. The days blurred together as we hunted for the creature. We set traps, placed cameras, and increased patrols, but it was always one step ahead. Then, one night, everything came to a head. Lang and I were patrolling near the cave when we heard a low, guttural sound. We froze, scanning the darkness with our flashlights. The sound grew louder, closer, until it seemed to surround us. Back to back, I ordered, my voice steady despite the fear gnawing at my insides. We stood our ground, weapons drawn, as the shadows around us seemed to come alive. Suddenly a figure lunged at us from the darkness, its eyes glowing with an unholy light. I fired, the shot echoing through the forest, and the creature fell with a sickening thud. We approached cautiously, our flashlights revealing a grotesque sight. The creature was humanoid but twisted, with elongated limbs and a face that seemed half-human, half-animal. It wore tattered clothing, suggesting it had once been something else entirely. Jesus Christ, Lang muttered, kicking the creature's body. What the hell is this? I don't know, but I think we just found our killer, I replied, feeling a strange mix of relief and horror. As we prepared to call for backup, more sounds erupted around us. We were surrounded. The forest came alive with movement and suddenly we were fighting for our lives. I lost count of how many there were, but they kept coming, relentless and savage. Lang went down first, dragged into the darkness by a creature twice her size. I fought with everything I had, firing until my gun clicked empty, then using it as a club. The air was filled with snarls, screams, and the stench of blood. In the chaos, I managed to break free and run. I didn't stop until I reached the edge of the forest, collapsing on the ground as the first rays of dawn broke through the trees. Back at the sheriff's office, I recounted the events to a stunned audience. Lang's body was never recovered, but the remains of the creatures we killed were taken for analysis. The official report labeled them as unknown predators, but I knew better. They were something far worse, something that defied explanation. As I left Wausau, I couldn't shake the feeling that the forest was watching me, that it would remember the ones who dared to challenge its dark secrets. Walking down Maple Street felt different today. The usual sounds of birds chirping and children playing were drowned out by the growing unease gnawing at me. My name is Elias Carson, and I work for the Missing Persons Unit in Portland, Oregon. My job is to find those who seem to vanish without a trace. It's a demanding job, but I never imagined it would lead me to this. It all started with a call from Lisa Vanderbilt, a prominent local philanthropist, reporting her husband, Greg, 
missing. He had gone for his usual morning jog and never returned. Portland, with its vast, dense forests and winding trails, is a haven for outdoor enthusiasts, but it also holds secrets in its depths. I arrived at the Vanderbilt Mansion, a sprawling estate on the outskirts of town. The place reeked of old money and prestige, with manicured lawns and towering oaks lining the driveway. Lisa greeted me at the door, her face pale and eyes red from crying. Elias, thank you for coming so quickly, she said, her voice trembling. Of course, Mrs. Vanderbilt. Can you tell me exactly what happened? I replied, trying to sound reassuring. He left around 6 a.m. for his run. He always takes the same route through Forest Park. When he didn't return by 8 a.m., I got worried. I went out looking for him, but found nothing. Have you contacted the police? Yes, but they haven't found anything either. They think he might have just run off. But Greg wouldn't do that. I know something's wrong. Forest Park is a vast area, covering over 5,000 acres of dense woodland and trails. It was going to be like finding a needle in a haystack. I decided to start at the beginning of Greg's usual trail. The entrance was marked by a worn wooden sign, barely visible under the thick canopy of trees. I walked the trail, looking for any signs of disturbance. The path was well-trodden, a mix of dirt and fallen leaves. After about an hour, I came across something unusual, a shoe, caked in mud and half-buried under leaves. It was a men's running shoe, size 10, the same size Lisa mentioned Greg wore. As I crouched to inspect it, a rustling noise came from the bushes to my left. I turned quickly, but there was nothing there. I chalked it up to the wind or an animal. I continued down the trail, feeling the weight of the forest pressing in on me. I soon came upon a small clearing with a creek running through it. The water was clear, reflecting the dappled sunlight that managed to pierce through the trees. Something in the water caught my eye, a glint of metal. I stepped closer and saw a watch, the kind runners used to track their progress. It was still ticking, but the band was broken. I bagged it and noted the time, then continued my search. As the day wore on, I felt a growing sense of dread. The forest was unnervingly quiet, as if holding its breath. Suddenly, I heard a scream, a blood-curdling cry that echoed through the trees. I ran towards the sound, my heart pounding in my chest. I reached another clearing, this one larger and more open. There, lying in the grass, was Greg. He was barely recognizable, his face a mask of terror, and his body covered in deep gashes. Blood pooled around him, soaking into the earth. My stomach churned at the sight. I radioed for backup and secured the area. As I waited, I examined the wounds. They were unlike anything I'd seen before, deep, jagged, as if made by something with claws. My mind raced, trying to piece together what could have done this. A bear, maybe? But the wounds were too precise, too intentional. The police arrived, and the scene was soon swarming with officers and medical personnel. I briefed Detective Harris, a seasoned officer with a reputation for being thorough. We need to find out what did this, I said, still shaken by the sight. Harris nodded, his face grim. We'll get the forensics team on it. This isn't the first strange case we've had in these woods. What do you mean? I asked, my curiosity piqued. There have been reports of people going missing, only to be found dead days later, mutilated. We always thought it was wild animals, but this... this is different. Over the next few days, the forensics team worked tirelessly. They found traces of an unknown substance on Greg's wounds, something that didn't match any known animal. Meanwhile, I delved into the park's history, looking for any clues. I came across old newspaper clippings about disappearances dating back decades. Each case had similarities, people vanishing near the same area, bodies found with similar wounds. The locals had their theories, ranging from wild animals to something more sinister. One name kept coming up, a local legend about the Wendigo, a creature from Native American folklore said to haunt the forest, preying on those who venture too deep. It was a far-fetched idea, but given the evidence, I couldn't rule anything out. I met with an elder from the nearby Chinook tribe, hoping to gain more insight. 
he welcomed me into his home, a modest cabin filled with artifacts and photographs. Elder Kimmy, thank you for seeing me, I began. Call me Joseph, he said with a gentle smile. What brings you here, Elias? I explained my findings and the strange circumstances surrounding Greg's death. Joseph listened intently, nodding occasionally. The Wendigo is a powerful spirit, he said after a moment. It represents insatiable greed and hunger, consuming all in its path. The legend says it was once human but transformed by its own cannibalistic desires. But this is just a legend, right? A story? I asked, trying to stay rational. Legends often have a basis in truth, Joseph replied. Whether it's a spirit or something else, the forest holds many secrets. Be careful, Elias. Not everything can be explained by science. Armed with this new perspective, I returned to the forest, determined to find answers. I retraced my steps, hoping to uncover more clues. The deeper I went, the more oppressive the atmosphere became. It felt as if the trees were watching me, their branches whispering secrets. I reached the creek again, where I had found Greg's watch. This time, I noticed something I had missed before, a faint trail leading away from the water. I followed it, my senses on high alert. The trail led to a cave, hidden behind a thick curtain of vines. I hesitated at the entrance, the darkness within seeming to pulse with malevolence. Taking a deep breath, I stepped inside, my flashlight cutting through the gloom. The cave was larger than I expected, with tunnels branching off in different directions. The air was thick with a musty smell, mixed with something else, something metallic. I followed the scent, my heart pounding in my chest. I came to a large chamber, and what I saw made my blood run cold. The walls were covered in crude drawings, depicting scenes of violence and carnage. Bones littered the floor, some broken and gnawed. And in the center of the chamber was a makeshift altar, covered in dried blood. As I approached, I saw something glinting in the dim light. A set of keys, the kind Greg had carried. My mind raced. This was no animal. This was something far more sinister. I heard a noise behind me and turned to see a figure emerging from the shadows. It was tall, emaciated, with skin stretched tight over its bones. Its eyes glowed with a sickly light, and its mouth was a gaping maw filled with sharp teeth. I backed away, my flashlight trembling in my hand. The creature let out a low, guttural sound, and I knew I was in trouble. I fumbled for my radio, but it slipped from my grasp and clattered to the floor. The creature lunged at me, its claws slashing through the air. I managed to dodge, but barely. My mind raced, trying to think of a way out. I spotted a narrow tunnel to my left and bolted for it, the creature hot on my heels. The tunnel was tight, forcing me to crawl on my hands and knees. I could hear the creature behind me, its breath hot on my neck. I pushed myself harder, my muscles screaming in protest. I emerged into another chamber, this one smaller and more cramped. I spotted an exit on the far side and made a break for it. The creature was right behind me, its claws grazing my back. I burst out of the cave and into the blinding sunlight. I stumbled down the hill, my legs weak and shaky. I could hear the creature's furious roars behind me, but I didn't look back. I reached the main trail and collapsed, gasping for breath. I could hear the sound of approaching sirens, and I knew I was safe. The police arrived, and I told them everything. They combed the forest and found the cave, but the creature was gone. Greg's death was ruled as an animal attack. But I knew the truth. The forest held dark secrets, and something was out there, waiting. The case was closed, but the memory of that day haunted me. I continued my work, but with a newfound caution. The forest had changed me and I knew that I would never be the same again. In the end, the creature remained a mystery, a dark presence lurking in the shadows of Forest Park. And as for me, I kept my eyes open, always wary, knowing that some things are better left undiscovered. The sun had barely risen when I got the call. 
It was just another missing persons case, or so I thought. I'm Kellen Drayton, a detective with the Missing Persons Unit, an agency exclusively focused on tracking down those who vanish without a trace. We deal with runaways, kidnappings, and the occasional Jane Doe. But this case was different. It was the start of something I couldn't have imagined. The call came from a remote part of Maine, a place called Pine Hollow. Population, barely 500. The local sheriff, a grizzled veteran named Roy Tannen, was at his wit's end. Three people had gone missing in the span of a week. No leads, no clues, nothing. Roy sounded scared, and in our line of work, that's saying something. I packed my bag and took the next flight out, arriving in Pine Hollow by late afternoon. The town was quaint, nestled among towering pines with a single main street lined with mom-and-pop stores. It felt like stepping back in time, but the unease was palpable. The townsfolk whispered among themselves, eyes darting with suspicion and fear. It was clear they were hiding something. But what? Sheriff Tannen met me outside the town's only diner, a place called Millie's. He was as gruff in person as he had sounded on the phone, with a salt-and-pepper beard and piercing blue eyes that spoke of too many sleepless nights. We exchanged a few pleasantries before he cut to the chase. Kellen, I appreciate you coming out here. We've had three disappearances. First was Caleb Price, a logger. Then Mary Lou, she runs the bakery. Last one was young Tommy Miller, just ten years old. He paused, taking a deep breath. We found nothing. No tracks, no signs of struggle, nothing. I nodded, taking notes. When did each of them go missing? Caleb disappeared last Tuesday, Mary Lou on Thursday, and Tommy just yesterday. Roy rubbed his temples. And we've got another problem. There's something out there, something that's not human. I looked up, startled. Not human? Roy nodded gravely. There have been sightings. People talk about a creature big as a bear but faster, meaner. It's been seen lurking near the woods. I didn't believe it at first, but now I'm not so sure. As night fell, Roy and I decided to visit Caleb's cabin, the last place he was seen. It was deep in the woods, about a mile from the nearest road. The air was cool and crisp, the silence broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves. Roy led the way, his flashlight cutting through the darkness. Caleb's cabin was small and rustic, with a single window and a sturdy wooden door. We knocked, more out of habit than hope, and then stepped inside. The place was a mess, furniture overturned and papers strewn about. But what caught my eye was a strange symbol carved into the wooden floor, a circle with intricate patterns radiating from its center. What's this? I asked, pointing to the carving. Roy shook his head. No idea. It wasn't here last time I checked. As we examined the symbol, a chilling howl echoed through the forest. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard, a mix of rage and pain that sent shivers down my spine. Roy and I exchanged a glance and bolted outside, guns drawn. The forest was eerily quiet, the only sound our heavy breathing. We saw it then, just a glimpse through the trees, a hulking figure moving with unnatural speed. It was tall, easily seven feet, with long limbs and a distorted, hunched back. Its eyes glinted in the flashlight's beam, but then it vanished, melting into the shadows. What the hell was that? I whispered. Roy shook his head. I don't know, but it's been getting bolder. We need to find out what it wants. The next day, we decided to set a trap. Roy rounded up a few townsfolk who had seen the creature, and we devised a plan. We'd use a goat as bait, hoping to lure it into the open. It felt like a long shot, but we were desperate. We set up near the edge of the woods, where the sightings had been most frequent. The goat bleated nervously, tied to a stake in the ground. We waited, hidden among the trees, weapons at the ready. Hours passed, the sun dipped below the horizon, and the forest grew darker and more menacing. Then, just as we were about to give up, we heard it. The soft crunch of leaves, the snap of a twig. 
the creature emerged from the shadows, eyes fixed on the goat. It was even more terrifying up close, with matted fur, elongated limbs, and a grotesque, almost human-like face. We held our breath as it approached the goat. Then, with a sudden violent motion, it lunged. But before it could reach its prey, we opened fire. The creature howled, a sound of pure agony, and charged at us. We scattered, firing wildly. Roy managed to land a shot in its leg, slowing it down, but it was still coming. In the chaos, I tripped over a root and fell hard, my gun skidding out of reach. The creature was upon me in an instant, its foul breath hot on my face. I braced for the end, but then there was a loud crack, and the creature staggered back. Roy had taken a desperate shot with his rifle, hitting it square in the chest. The creature collapsed, writhing and screeching. As it lay dying, it transformed, shrinking and contorting until it resembled an emaciated man, his body covered in strange, ritualistic scars. We approached cautiously, weapons still drawn. The man looked up at us with a mix of rage and sorrow, then went still. We were left in stunned silence, trying to process what had just happened. Roy broke the silence first. What the hell was that? I shook my head. I don't know, but it's over. We need to get the bodies and evidence back to town. We spent the next few hours gathering everything we could, documenting the scene. By the time we returned to Pine Hollow, it was dawn. The townsfolk were waiting, their faces a mix of fear and relief. We explained what had happened, showed them the body. There were tears, gasps, and whispered prayers. The town's doctor, an elderly woman named Dr. Irene Lasky, examined the body. She confirmed what we suspected. The man had been undergoing some kind of transformation, possibly triggered by the symbols we found in Caleb's cabin. Days later, we discovered an old journal in Caleb's belongings. It detailed a series of rituals he had been performing, ancient rites meant to summon a guardian spirit to protect the town. But something had gone horribly wrong, and instead of a guardian, he had summoned a malevolent force. The disappearances stopped after that, and life in Pine Hollow slowly returned to normal. The town tried to move on, but the memory of those dark days lingered, a shadow over their idyllic lives. I returned to the city, back to the endless stream of missing persons cases. But Pine Hollow stayed with me, a reminder of the thin line between our world and the unknown. That's all I have to say about Pine Hollow. It was one of those mornings when everything seemed to go wrong. I had spilled coffee on my shirt, missed my train, and arrived at the office late. I work for the Missing Persons Unit, a small agency dedicated to finding people who have vanished without a trace. We're a tight-knit group, and being late is not something that goes unnoticed. My boss, Randall Thorne, was already waiting for me, tapping his fingers impatiently on the edge of my desk. Late again, McAllister, he said not bothering to hide his irritation. We've got a new case, and it's urgent. A young woman named Evelyn Ross disappeared last night near Pine Ridge. Her family is frantic, and the local police are at a loss. Get on it. I nodded, grabbing my jacket and the case file he handed me. Pine Ridge was a small town about an hour's drive from the city, nestled in the dense woods of northern Maine. It was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone, and strangers stood out like a sore thumb. The drive gave me time to read through Evelyn's file. She was 26, recently moved back to Pine Ridge after finishing her degree in environmental science. Her family described her as responsible and cautious, not the type to just vanish. Her last known location was near the old logging road on the outskirts of town, a place known for its treacherous terrain and dense forest. When I arrived in Pine Ridge, I was greeted by Sheriff Hank Talbot a grizzled man in his late fifties who looked like he'd seen it all. McAllister, right? He said, extending a hand. Glad you could make it. This one's got us all scratching our heads. We've searched the area, but it's like she just disappeared into thin air. Any witnesses? I asked, shaking his hand. None that we know of, he replied. We found her car parked by the side of the road, keys still in the ignition. Her phone and purse were inside, but no sign of her. 
We drove to the site where Evelyn's car had been found. It was a desolate stretch of road, flanked by thick woods on either side. The only sound was the rustling of leaves in the breeze and the distant call of a bird. She was supposed to meet a friend for dinner but never showed up, Sheriff Talbot explained as we walked around the car. Her friend called her but there was no answer. The next morning her parents reported her missing. I examined the car and the surrounding area. There were no signs of a struggle, no footprints leading away from the car, nothing to indicate where she might have gone. It was as if she had simply vanished. Mind if I take a look around? I asked. Be my guest, Talbot replied. Just be careful. These woods can be dangerous, especially if you don't know your way around. I ventured into the forest, following a faint trail that led deeper into the woods. The trees were tall and dense, their branches intertwining to form a canopy that blocked out most of the sunlight. The ground was uneven, covered in a thick layer of leaves and underbrush. As I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. It was an unsettling sensation, like eyes were following my every move. I stopped and listened, but there was nothing except the sound of my own breathing and the occasional snap of a twig. I continued on, my senses on high alert. The further I went, the more oppressive the atmosphere became. It was as if the forest itself was closing in on me, its shadows growing longer and darker. After what felt like hours, I stumbled upon a small clearing. In the center was an old, dilapidated cabin, its wooden walls weathered and covered in moss. The door was slightly ajar, creaking on its hinges as it swayed in the breeze. I approached cautiously, my hand resting on the gun at my hip. Pushing the door open, I stepped inside. The interior was dark and musty, filled with the scent of decay. Broken furniture and debris littered the floor, and the walls were covered in strange symbols, carved deeply into the wood. I moved deeper into the cabin, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. Suddenly, a noise behind me made me spin around, gun drawn. But there was nothing there. Just the empty doorway and the forest beyond. Then I heard it again. A faint, almost imperceptible whisper. It seemed to come from the walls themselves, a low, guttural murmur that sent a shiver down my spine. I tried to make out the words, but they were in a language I didn't recognize. I turned back towards the room and froze. Standing in the corner was a figure, its form barely visible in the dim light. It was tall and gaunt, its skin pale and stretched tight over its bones. Its eyes, dark and hollow, seemed to bore into me, filling me with an overwhelming sense of dread. Before I could react, the figure lunged at me. I fired my gun, but the bullet seemed to pass right through it. It grabbed me, its touch cold and clammy, and I felt a searing pain as its claws dug into my flesh. I struggled to break free, but it was too strong. It lifted me off the ground, its grip tightening around my throat. My vision began to blur, and I could feel myself slipping into unconsciousness. Just as I thought it was all over, the creature suddenly released me. I fell to the floor, gasping for air. When I looked up, it was gone, leaving only the echo of its whispers behind. I stumbled out of the cabin, my mind reeling. I had to get out of there, had to find help. But as I made my way back through the forest, I realized I was lost. The trees all looked the same, and the trail I had followed was nowhere to be found. Panic set in as the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the forest floor. I wandered for what felt like hours, the sense of being watched growing stronger with each passing minute. Finally, I saw a light in the distance. I made my way towards it, my heart pounding in my chest. It was a campsite, with a small fire burning in the center. Two figures sat by the fire, their faces illuminated by the flickering flames. As I approached, they looked up, their expressions turning to shock and concern. "'Are you okay?' One of them asked, standing up and rushing over to me. I... I don't know, I stammered, collapsing to the ground. There's something in the woods. Something not human. The other figure, a woman, knelt beside me, checking my wounds. We need to get him to a hospital, she said urgently. He's hurt pretty bad. 
They helped me to my feet and led me to their car. As we drove back to town, I tried to explain what had happened, but my mind was a jumbled mess of fear and confusion. When we arrived at the hospital, I was taken into the emergency room and treated for my injuries. The doctors and nurses were kind, but they couldn't hide their skepticism when I told them about the creature in the woods. After I was patched up, Sheriff Talbot came to see me. You're lucky to be alive, he said, his expression grim. We searched the area, but there's no sign of the cabin you described, or the creature you saw. I know what I saw, I insisted, my voice shaking. It was real, and it's still out there. Talbot sighed. We'll keep looking, but I have to be honest with you, McAllister. It's not the first time someone's gone missing in those woods, and it probably won't be the last. I nodded, knowing he was right, but I also knew that I couldn't just walk away from this. Evelyn Ross was still out there, somewhere, and I had to find her. As I lay in the hospital bed that night, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the beginning. There was something in those woods, something ancient and malevolent, and I was determined to uncover the truth, no matter the cost. It was one of those muggy, oppressive days in Lafayette, Louisiana, where the air seemed to hang heavy with moisture and the faint scent of the bayou. I was deep into my paperwork at the missing persons unit, flipping through the details of a particularly puzzling case involving a missing woman named Felicity Hargrove. I'd been working in the MPU for over a decade, and while the cases were often challenging, they were rarely as eerie as this one. My name's Grady Thorne, by the way, and I've seen my fair share of strange occurrences. Felicity's case was something else, though. She had disappeared without a trace from her secluded farmhouse near the edge of the Atchafalaya Basin. The only clues left behind were muddy footprints and a half-eaten dinner still warm on the table. "'Hey, Grady,' called my partner, Sasha Carmichael, from her desk. "'You got a minute? I found something weird.' I walked over, intrigued. Sasha was not one to use the word weird lightly. "'What have you got?' She pointed to her computer screen, which displayed satellite images of the area around Felicity's home. "'Check this out.' These images were taken about two hours apart on the night Felicity went missing. Look at the field behind her house. I squinted at the screen. In the first image, the field was just a regular patch of tall grass. In the second, there were clear, circular patterns flattened into the ground. Crop circles? Out here? I shook my head. This doesn't make sense. No sign of vehicles. Nothing. Sasha nodded. I thought the same. It's like something landed there, but there's no trace of how it arrived or left. All right, let's head out there. See what we can find, I said, grabbing my jacket. We drove out to Felicity's farmhouse, the setting sun casting long shadows over the dense cypress trees. The air was thick with the hum of cicadas. The farmhouse itself was eerily quiet, the only sound the creaking of the wooden porch as we approached. Inside, everything was as described in the report. The uneaten dinner on the table, a knocked-over chair, and those muddy footprints leading out the back door. We followed the trail outside, past the neglected vegetable garden, and into the field where Sasha had seen the patterns. The circles in the grass were more unsettling in person, perfectly round, as if something heavy had pressed down with precise force. What the hell could do this? Sasha muttered. No idea, I replied, my eyes scanning the darkening tree line. But we need to be careful. As we inspected the area, a sudden rustling in the bushes caught our attention. We both drew our flashlights, the beams cutting through the twilight gloom. Who's there? I called out. Silence. Then a low, almost imperceptible hum began to fill the air, making the hair on my arms stand up. The bushes parted and outstepped the last thing I expected to see. A tall, gaunt figure covered in dark, matted fur. Its limbs were long and spindly, with clawed fingers that seemed too delicate for its size. What the... Sasha started, but the creature moved faster than anything I'd ever seen. It lunged at us, and I barely had time to push Sasha out of the way before it was upon me. The thing's claws raked across my arm, tearing through fabric and flesh like paper. 
Pain shot through me, but adrenaline kept me moving. I swung my flashlight at its face, connecting with a sickening thud. It stumbled back, giving Sasha enough time to draw her gun. Stay back! She yelled, firing a warning shot into the ground. The creature hissed, a sound that resonated deep in my chest, before retreating into the trees with unnatural grace. Grady, you okay? Sasha asked, helping me to my feet. Yeah, just a scratch. I lied, wincing as blood dripped from my arm. We need to get out of here. Now. We didn't need to be told twice. We sprinted back to the car, the oppressive feeling of being watched never leaving us until we were safely back on the main road. As we sped towards town, the events of the evening replayed in my mind. What the hell was that thing? And what did it have to do with Felicity's disappearance? Back at the office, eh? Sasha cleaned in and bandaged my arm while we discussed our next steps. We need to go back, she said firmly. We need more evidence. Something to prove what we saw. I nodded. Tomorrow. We'll get some gear, and we'll be better prepared. The following day, we returned to the farmhouse with more equipment. Cameras, motion sensors, and tranquilizer darts, just in case. We set up the cameras around the field and placed the sensors in the bushes where the creature had emerged. As night fell, we settled in for a long wait, the hum of the equipment the only sound breaking the silence. Hours passed, and just when I was about to suggest we call it a night, the motion sensors started beeping. Something's out there, Sasha whispered, her hand hovering over her gun. We watched the monitors, the grainy night vision showing a shadowy figure moving through the trees. It was the creature, but this time it wasn't alone. Three more figures, similar in shape but smaller, followed behind it. Jesus, there's more of them, I muttered. We need to get closer. We crept out into the field, careful to stay hidden. The creatures moved towards the house, their movements fluid and eerily synchronized. One of the smaller ones stopped, sniffing the air before turning its head directly towards our hiding spot. My heart pounded in my chest as I held my breath. It let out a series of clicks and chirps, a sound that seemed to be a form of communication. The larger creature responded with a low hum, and they all turned away from the house, heading back into the trees. What the hell was that? Sasha breathed. Some kind of pack behavior, I guessed. Maybe they're hunting. We followed at a safe distance, watching as the creatures disappeared into a hidden cave at the base of a large cypress tree. We need to see what's in there. I said, my curiosity outweighing my fear. We approached the cave entrance, the smell of damp earth and decay growing stronger with each step. Inside, the light from our flashlights revealed a scene that made my stomach churn. Bones, both animal and human, littered the ground, gnawed clean and scattered haphazardly. In the center of the cave, Felicity Hargrove lay sprawled on the ground, her eyes wide open but unseeing. She was covered in deep gashes, her lifeless body a testament to the violence she had endured. Poor woman, Sasha whispered. We need to get her out of here. As we moved to retrieve her body, the hum started again, louder and more intense than before. The creatures were returning. We have to go, I said urgently. Now! We grabbed Felicity and sprinted out of the cave, the creatures' screeches echoing behind us. We barely made it to the car, shoving her body into the back seat and peeling out of there as fast as possible. Back at the station, we handed Felicity's body over to the coroner and filed our report. The evidence we collected, the footage, the bones, and the injuries on Felicity, was undeniable proof of the creature's existence. In the end, the cave was sealed off, and the area was declared a restricted zone. The public was told a fabricated story about a dangerous wild animal to keep them away, but those of us who knew the truth were left with more questions than answers. The investigation continued, but the creatures were never found again. Some say they moved deeper into the bayou, hiding from human eyes. Others believe they were always there, watching and waiting for their next prey. As for me, I returned to my work at the MPU, my arms scarred but my resolve unshaken. There were always more missing persons to find, more mysteries to solve, and while I'd seen things that defied explanation, 
I knew one thing for sure. There's always more out there, just beyond the reach of understanding, waiting to be discovered. The day started like any other, with a cup of coffee in hand and a stack of case files on my desk. My name is Quentin Osborne, and I work for the Missing Persons Unit, a division that operates in the shadows, tackling the cases no one else can solve. I've been in this line of work for over a decade, dealing with everything from runaway teens to cold cases that span decades. Today's assignment was different, though. It had a sense of urgency that made my skin crawl. I sat in my cluttered office, the hum of fluorescent lights overhead. The old wooden chair creaked under my weight as I sifted through the latest case. A 12-year-old girl named Emma Larkins had vanished from her family's rural home in Elk Grove, California just last night. No signs of forced entry, no ransom note, nothing. She seemed to have disappeared into thin air. The details were sparse, but there was a troubling similarity to a series of unsolved cases that had haunted me for years. Cases where children vanished without a trace from remote locations, always at night, always in a similar manner. I grabbed my jacket, the weight of my service revolver reassuring against my hip, and headed out to Elk Grove. Elk Grove is a small town nestled among dense forests and rolling hills. It's the kind of place where everyone knows everyone, and secrets are hard to keep. The Larkin's house was a modest, single-story home at the edge of a sprawling forest. I arrived to find the family in shambles. Emma's parents, Karen and John, were barely holding it together. Their grief and desperation were palpable, hanging heavy in the air. We put her to bed around 8 p.m., Karen said, clutching a tissue in her trembling hands. When we checked on her this morning, she was gone. John added, We searched the house, the yard, even the woods nearby. There's no sign of her. It's like she just vanished. I walked through the house looking for anything the local police might have missed. Emma's room was typical for a girl her age. Stuffed animals, posters of pop stars, a bed with rumpled pink sheets. But something felt off. There was a faint, acrid smell in the air, almost like burnt metal. I made a note of it. Has Emma ever talked about running away or meeting someone online? I asked. Karen shook her head. No. She's a good kid. She wouldn't just leave. After getting all the information I could from the Larkins, I decided to search the woods myself. The forest was dense, the trees towering and ancient, their canopies forming a thick roof that barely let any light through. It was eerily quiet, the kind of silence that made the hair on the back of your neck stand up. As I ventured deeper, the sense of being watched grew stronger. I found a small clearing about half a mile from the house. In the center was a circle of charred ground, the same burnt metal smell lingering in the air. I knelt down, examining the soil. It was scorched, as if something extremely hot had touched it. But there were no signs of a campfire or any other human activity. Just as I was about to leave, I heard a faint rustling behind me. I turned, my hand instinctively moving to my gun. Standing at the edge of the clearing was a figure, tall, thin, and covered in some kind of ragged, dark cloak. Its face was hidden in the shadows of a hood. My heart raced as I called out, Who's there? The figure didn't respond but started moving towards me, gliding rather than walking. I drew my gun, aiming it squarely at the figure. Stop right there! It stopped, tilting its head as if studying me. Then, with a swift motion, it lifted its hood. What I saw made my blood run cold. Its face was a grotesque mockery of a human, with elongated features and a mouth that seemed to stretch unnaturally wide. Its eyes were pitch black, devoid of any emotion or life. Before I could react, it lunged at me with incredible speed. I fired, but the bullet seemed to pass through it, as if it was made of smoke. I stumbled back, tripping over a root and falling hard onto my back. The creature was on top of me in an instant, its cold, clawed hands wrapping around my throat. I struggled, gasping for air, my vision blurring. With a desperate effort, I reached into my jacket and pulled out a small, silver crucifix. I thrust it towards the creature's face. It recoiled, hissing like a wild animal. 
and vanished into the trees. I lay there for a moment trying to catch my breath and process what had just happened. Whatever that thing was, it was no ordinary kidnapper. I scrambled to my feet and raced back to the Larkin's house. The forest seemed to close in around me, every shadow a potential threat. When I burst through the door, Karen and John looked at me with a mixture of hope and fear. Did you find her? John asked. No, I panted. But there's something out there. Something not human. I explained what had happened, expecting them to think I was crazy. But instead, Karen's eyes widened with recognition. We've heard stories, she said quietly. Old legends about creatures in the woods. We thought they were just tales to scare children. Whatever it is, it's real, I said. And it's taken Emma. I spent the next few hours contacting my superiors and gathering equipment. If we were dealing with something supernatural, I needed all the help I could get. By nightfall, I was back in the forest, armed with silver bullets, holy water, and other protective charms. The local sheriff, Marcus Hensley, had insisted on coming along. He was skeptical but willing to help. We moved cautiously through the trees, every snap of a twig making us jump. The forest was even darker than before, the shadows seeming to move and shift around us. As we approached the clearing, the air grew colder, and that familiar burnt metal smell returned. There, I whispered, pointing to the charred circle. That's where I saw it. Marcus knelt down, examining the ground. What the hell could cause this? Before I could answer, the creature emerged from the trees, its cloak billowing like smoke. This time, it wasn't alone. Three more figures appeared, each as twisted and nightmarish as the first. Holy shit, Marcus breathed, his hand moving to his gun. Silver bullets, I reminded him. Aim for the heart. The creatures moved in unison, their black eyes fixed on us. We opened fire, the gunshots echoing through the forest. Two of the creatures dissolved into mist, but the other two kept coming. One of them lunged at Marcus, its claws raking across his chest. He cried out, stumbling back, but managed to fire a shot into its chest. The creature shrieked and vanished. The last one turned its attention to me. I emptied my clip into it, but it kept coming, relentless. It grabbed me by the throat, lifting me off the ground. I struggled, feeling its cold, dark power sapping my strength. With my last ounce of energy, I smashed a vial of holy water against its face. It screamed, dropping me and clutching its burning flesh. I grabbed my silver knife and drove it into the creature's heart. It convulsed, then disintegrated into a cloud of ash. I collapsed, exhausted and battered, but alive. Marcus was in bad shape, but he'd survive. We had dealt with the immediate threat, but Emma was still missing. We made our way back to the Larkin's house. Karen and John were waiting, their faces pale with worry. Did you find her? Karen asked, her voice barely a whisper. No, I admitted, but we're getting closer. Whatever took her is powerful, but it's not invincible. We'll find her. I spent the next few hours coordinating with other agents, gathering more resources, and planning our next move. The creatures we'd faced were just the beginning. There had to be more out there, and we needed to be ready. As dawn broke, I stood on the porch of the Larkin's house, looking out at the forest. The sense of being watched was still there, but it felt different now. Less menacing, more curious. I knew this fight was far from over, but I was ready. We would find Emma, and we would bring her home. For now, I took a deep breath, the cool morning air filling my lungs. There was a long road ahead, but we were on the right path. Do you know how it feels to wake up every day with the weight of the world on your shoulders? It's a bit like having a hangover from a never-ending party, only without the fun memories. I'm Jackson Whitmore, and I work for the Missing Persons Unit in Tallahassee, Florida. This job, it's not just a 9-to-5 gig. It's a roller coaster ride through the darkest corners of human experience. I was already two cups of coffee into my day when the call came in. 
A young woman named Delilah Gray, only 24, had disappeared from her apartment complex. No signs of struggle, no forced entry, just vanished. Her boyfriend, Dean, was frantic, and the local PD was stumped. They handed it over to us, hoping for a miracle. Delilah's last known location was her apartment on the second floor of an old, crumbling building in a sketchy part of town. The place had character, which is a polite way of saying it looked like it should have been condemned years ago. I met with Dean, a wiry guy with a mop of curly hair and eyes that darted around like a cornered animal. She wouldn't just leave, Dean insisted, his voice cracking. Something happened to her, I know it. I nodded, taking in the details. The apartment was small, cluttered with books and half-finished art projects. Delilah was an artist, it seemed. Her life spread out in vibrant, chaotic splashes of color. But there was something off, a sense of intrusion, like the air itself was holding its breath. We started the usual rounds, talking to neighbors, checking security footage, looking for any clues. Mrs. Higgins, the elderly woman across the hall, mentioned seeing a strange man lurking around the building the night Delilah disappeared. Tall, with a hunched posture, and always wearing a dark hoodie that obscured his face. Like a shadow, she whispered, her hands trembling. Always there, but never really seen. Creepy, but not exactly a solid lead. Still, we kept digging. The building's security cameras were ancient and barely functional, but with some coaxing, we managed to pull a few frames. Sure enough, there was the shadowy figure, just as Mrs. Higgins described. The footage showed him entering the building around midnight, but then he vanished. No sign of him leaving, no trace at all. It was like he had dissolved into the walls. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. Something was very wrong here. As we continued our investigation, more unsettling details emerged. Delilah had been complaining to friends about strange noises at night, scratching sounds, like something trying to claw its way in. She had also mentioned feeling watched, even when she was alone. Her art reflected this growing paranoia, with recent pieces depicting twisted, nightmarish figures lurking in the shadows. Dean was no help either. His alibi checked out, but his desperation was palpable. He admitted they had been arguing a lot lately, mostly about her increasing obsession with the noises and the mysterious figure. He seemed genuinely distraught, but there was a wildness in his eyes that made me uneasy. We decided to set up a stakeout, hoping the shadowy figure would return. I partnered with Lena Vasquez, my go-to in situations like this. She's sharp, resourceful, and has a knack for spotting things others miss. We hunkered down in a dingy van across the street, cameras rolling, waiting for any sign of movement. Hours passed, and just as the night seemed like it would be another dead end, there he was. The figure emerged from the darkness, moving with an unnatural fluidity. We watched as he approached the building, his face hidden in the shadow of his hoodie. He paused at the entrance, looking around as if sensing he was being watched. Do you see that? Lena whispered, her eyes wide. I nodded, unable to tear my gaze away. The figure seemed to shimmer, almost like he was phasing in and out of reality. He slipped inside the building, and we followed trying to stay as silent as possible. The hallways were eerily quiet, every creak of the floorboards echoing like a gunshot. We tracked him to Delilah's apartment where he disappeared once more. No sound, no trace. It was as if he had become one with the shadows. Lena and I exchanged a look, both of us feeling the same creeping dread. We decided to search the apartment again, hoping to find something we had missed. In the back of the closet, behind a stack of canvases, we found a hidden door. It was small, barely noticeable, and it led to a narrow staircase descending into darkness. With our flashlights cutting through the gloom, we descended, the air growing colder and more oppressive with each step. At the bottom, we found a labyrinth of tunnels, the walls lined with strange symbols and runes. The air was thick with the scent of decay, and something else, something metallic. We followed the tunnels, the sense of being watched growing stronger with every turn. And then we found her. Delilah, lying on a makeshift altar, 
her body surrounded by candles and strange artifacts. She was alive, but barely. Her skin was pale, her breathing shallow. It was clear she had been here for days, maybe even weeks. But the most disturbing thing was the figure standing over her. He was no longer hidden in shadows, and his face was a grotesque mask of scars and twisted flesh. His eyes glowed with an unnatural light, and his mouth twisted into a grotesque grin. Welcome, he hissed, his voice like nails on a chalkboard. You shouldn't have come here. We didn't have time to react before he lunged at us, moving with inhuman speed. Lena fired her weapon, but the bullets seemed to pass through him as if he were made of smoke. He grabbed her, lifting her off the ground with terrifying strength. I charged at him, trying to tackle him, but it was like hitting a brick wall. He threw me aside effortlessly, and I slammed into the wall, my vision swimming. As I struggled to get up, I saw him dragging Lena towards the altar, his intentions horrifyingly clear. Desperation fueled me as I grabbed a nearby candle stand and swung it at him. This time it connected, and he screamed, a sound that seemed to shake the very foundation of the tunnels. He released Lena, and she scrambled away, her face pale but determined. Together, we managed to drive him back, using anything we could find as weapons. He fought with a feral intensity, but eventually he began to weaken. With one final blow, he dissolved into a cloud of black smoke, leaving behind only the echo of his scream. We rushed to Delilah, freeing her from the altar and carrying her out of the tunnels. She was weak, but alive, and as we emerged into the daylight, I felt a strange mix of relief and lingering fear. We called for backup, ensuring she was taken to the hospital for immediate care. The authorities launched a full investigation into the tunnels and the shadowy figure, but they found little to explain what had happened. Delilah recovered physically, but she was never the same, her eyes haunted by what she had endured. As for Lena and me, we returned to our work, the events of that night etched into our memories. The case remained unsolved, the figure never identified. But we knew one thing for certain. The shadows hold more than just darkness, and sometimes they look back. The day began like any other. I was drinking a lukewarm cup of coffee in my cramped office, scrolling through emails and reviewing the cases on my desk. Working for the missing persons unit in Phoenix, Arizona had its challenges, but it was a job I took seriously. My name's Caleb March, and I've seen more cases of people disappearing without a trace than I care to count. Today was different, though. I received a call from a distressed woman named Linda Foster. Her sister, Clara, had vanished while hiking in the Superstition Mountains. Linda was frantic, explaining that Clara was an experienced hiker who knew the area well. I assured her we'd start the search immediately, though I felt a knot forming in my stomach. The Superstition Mountains had a reputation for more than just their rugged beauty. There were old tales of mysterious disappearances and strange sightings that went back centuries. By the time I reached the trailhead, it was late morning. The air was dry and the sun was already unforgiving, casting harsh shadows on the rocky landscape. I met Linda there, her face pale and eyes red from crying. Thank you for coming so quickly, Mr. March, she said, her voice trembling. Clara went up the Devil's Canyon Trail yesterday afternoon. She was supposed to be back by nightfall, but I haven't heard from her since. I nodded, taking notes. Did she mention anything unusual? Any plans to explore off the main trails? Linda shook her head. No, nothing like that. She just wanted a day hike. Clara always sticks to the paths. We set off, Linda staying behind as instructed, and I began the arduous hike up Devil's Canyon. The trail was steep and unforgiving, much like the mountains themselves. I kept my eyes peeled for any sign of Clara. Hours passed with nothing to show for my efforts. The occasional calls of birds and the crunch of gravel under my boots were my only companions. As I ascended further into the canyon, the sense of unease grew stronger. The sun dipped lower in the sky, casting long, eerie shadows across the rocks. I reached a fork in the trail, with one path leading further up the canyon and another veering off to the side, towards a narrower, more treacherous route. Instinctively, I chose the narrower path. 
Something about it felt wrong, but also necessary. The air grew cooler as I proceeded, and a strange silence settled over the area, as if the very mountains were holding their breath. Then I saw it, a small, worn backpack partially hidden behind a boulder. My heart raced as I recognized it from the description Linda had given me. Clara's bag. I approached cautiously, calling out her name. There was no response. As I picked up the backpack, a faint, metallic smell reached my nose. Blood. I found a smear on one of the straps, dried but unmistakable. I scanned the area, looking for any signs of Clara. And that's when I saw something that made my blood run cold. A set of tracks, not human, leading deeper into the narrow passage. I followed the tracks, my senses on high alert. The path twisted and turned, leading to a small clearing surrounded by high rocks. There, in the middle of the clearing, was a sight that would haunt anyone. Bones, human bones, scattered and gnawed. My heart pounded as I moved closer, trying to identify anything that could confirm these remains were Clara's. And then I heard it, a low, guttural sound that raised every hair on my body. I turned slowly, my flashlight beam catching movement just beyond the rocks. Out stepped a creature, unlike anything I had ever seen. It was hunched and covered in matted fur with limbs that were disturbingly long and twisted. Its eyes, unblinking and too many, locked onto me. For a moment, neither of us moved, the horror of the situation paralyzing me. Then it lunged. Instinct took over. I ducked and rolled, the creature's swipe narrowly missing my head. I scrambled to my feet, pulling out the gun I always carried for emergencies. I fired once, twice, but the bullets seemed to do little more than anger it. The creature snarled and swiped again, this time catching my arm. Pain seared through me as I felt its claws tear through my flesh. Desperation set in. I backed away, trying to find a way out. The creature advanced, and I knew I couldn't keep dodging forever. My mind raced, looking for anything I could use to my advantage. Then I saw it. A narrow crevice in the rock wall to my left, just big enough to squeeze through. I bolted, diving into the crevice. The creature slammed into the rock wall, clawing and snapping at the entrance. I crawled deeper, the rock scraping against my already injured arm. The passage narrowed further, forcing me to move slowly and carefully. The sounds of the creature's rage echoed behind me, but I pressed on, driven by sheer survival instinct. After what felt like an eternity, I emerged on the other side, into another part of the canyon. The sounds of the creature had faded, but the adrenaline kept me moving. I found a narrow path leading downwards and took it, hoping it would eventually lead back to the main trail. By the time I reached the trailhead again, it was dark. Linda was waiting, her face a mask of anxiety. When she saw my condition, she gasped, rushing over to help. Where's Clara? She demanded, her voice a mix of hope and fear. I shook my head, unable to speak. The truth was too horrifying to relay at that moment. I handed her the backpack, the dried blood on it a grim confirmation of what I had found. Linda's face crumpled, and she let out a wail that echoed through the empty parking lot. We called the authorities, and soon the area was swarming with search and rescue teams. I led them back up the trail to the clearing, pointing out the remains and the crevice. The creature was nowhere to be seen, but the evidence of its presence was undeniable. As the authorities took over, I stepped back, my mind reeling from the day's events. My arm throbbed with pain, but the adrenaline had begun to fade, leaving a dull ache and a profound exhaustion in its wake. Linda approached me again, her eyes filled with gratitude and sorrow. Thank you for finding her, she said softly. At least now we know. I nodded, unable to find the words to respond. The events of the day had left an indelible mark, one that I knew would stay with me for a long time. But for now, the immediate danger had passed. The search teams continued their work, and I gave my statement to the police, detailing everything I had seen. As the night wore on, the scene became a flurry of activity, but I felt detached, as if watching it all from a distance. Eventually, I made my way back to my car. I sat behind the wheel, staring out into the darkness. The weight of the day settled on my shoulders, and I let out a long, weary sigh. 
There was still so much to process, so many questions left unanswered. But for now, all I could do was drive home and try to get some rest, knowing that the events of the day would be waiting for me when I woke. Driving down a winding road in the Pacific Northwest, you wouldn't think it would lead to much more than a remote cabin or two, some impressive pines, and maybe a deer or three crossing your path. This isn't the kind of place where you expect to find yourself wrapped up in a murder investigation. But here I am, Eric Bishop, trudging through the mud in search of a missing person named Lyle Anders. Missing Persons Unit. That's my gig and it's usually a lot of dead ends and paperwork. But this one was different. Lyle Anders was last seen hiking near the Olympic National Park, an area notorious for people disappearing under mysterious circumstances. But Lyle wasn't your average hiker. He was an investigative journalist. A stubborn one at that. He'd been working on some kind of expose, though no one seemed to know what about. His editor, a gruff man named Roy Jansen, hadn't heard from him in a week which was unusual enough to raise an alarm. So they called me. I parked my beat-up Jeep Wrangler at the trailhead, noting the eeriness of the place. Dense forest, thick fog, and an unsettling silence. I grabbed my gear and headed into the woods, following the path Lyle had likely taken. The trees loomed overhead, and the occasional rustle of leaves set my nerves on edge. It felt like being watched, which was ridiculous. Trees don't watch people. Still, there was a sensation that I wasn't alone. About two hours in, I found Lyle's camp. Tent still pitched, his backpack and supplies scattered about, but no sign of him. It didn't look like a struggle, more like he'd left in a hurry. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as I noticed something else. Strange claw marks on the trees around the camp. They were deep and jagged, not the kind any animal I knew of would make. But there were no tracks, no blood nothing else to go on. I radioed into my partner, Mike Hernandez, who was back at base coordinating the search. Found his camp. No sign of Lyle. Some weird claw marks on the trees here. Gonna keep looking. Roger that. Be careful out there, Bishop, Mike replied, his voice crackling through the static. Remember, you're not armed. We don't know what we're dealing with. Yeah, I knew that. My Glock was back at base part of some bureaucratic nonsense about this being a search and rescue, not a hunt. Still, it felt like a mistake. I pressed on, moving deeper into the woods. The further I went, the more uneasy I felt. It wasn't just the isolation. There was something wrong with these woods. A smell, like rotting meat, lingered in the air, growing stronger the deeper I went. I came upon a clearing with a strange, circular pattern of rocks and sticks. It didn't look natural, more like some kind of ritual site. My heart raced as I approached, half expecting something to jump out at me. Instead, I found a blood-stained notebook at the center. Lyle's. Flipping through the pages, I saw frantic, half-legible notes about creatures in the woods and experiments. The last entry was the most disturbing. I'm close to finding the truth. They know I'm here. They're coming. It was dated the day he went missing. A sudden snap of a twig behind me made me whirl around, but there was nothing there. Just the trees, silent and foreboding. I shoved the notebook into my pack and started back towards Lyle's camp. Whatever had happened here, I needed to get back and regroup with Mike. I barely made it a few steps when I heard it. A low, guttural sound, unlike any animal I'd ever encountered. It was close. Too close. I broke into a run, my boots pounding against the forest floor. The sound followed, growing louder, more insistent. Panic set in, my mind racing with images of what might be chasing me. I didn't look back. The clearing came into view, and I bolted towards it, hoping to find some sort of cover. Just as I reached the edge, something hit me from behind with incredible force, sending me sprawling to the ground. Pain shot through my side as I scrambled to my feet, desperate to see my attacker. What I saw defied explanation. 
It stood on two legs, covered in matted fur, with long, sinewy arms ending in claws that matched the marks on the trees. Its face was grotesque, a twisted mockery of human and animal features, with eyes that seemed almost intelligent. It let out a roar, revealing sharp, glistening teeth. I didn't have time to think, only react. I grabbed a branch from the ground and swung it with all my might. The creature barely flinched, knocking it aside like it was nothing. It lunged at me again, and I dodged, feeling its claws graze my arm. Blood poured from the wound, but I kept moving, adrenaline driving me forward. I stumbled upon an old hunting cabin I hadn't noticed before. Bursting through the door, I slammed it shut and barricaded it with a heavy wooden beam. The creature pounded against it, the door creaking under the force. I searched the cabin frantically, looking for anything I could use as a weapon. My eyes fell on an old rifle mounted on the wall. I pulled it down, checking the chamber. Loaded. Thank God. The door was starting to give way as I aimed, hands shaking. The creature burst through and I fired the sound deafening in the confined space. The shot hit its shoulder and it let out a howl of pain, retreating momentarily. I fired again, aiming for its head this time. The bullet struck true, and the creature collapsed, a final, guttural noise escaping its throat. I stood there, breathing heavily, staring at the body. What the hell had I just killed? I radioed Mike, my voice trembling. Hernandez, you're not going to believe this. I found Anders' notes. Some kind of creature got him. It's dead now. Send a team to my location. And bring a damn gun. Hours later, the team arrived. They were just as shocked as I was. The body of the creature was loaded onto a truck, and we all knew this wasn't something that would be easily explained. Lyle Anders was confirmed dead, his body found near the ritual site, mauled beyond recognition. The official report would probably cover it up, some nonsense about a bear attack or an animal gone rogue. But I knew what I saw, and so did the others. There were things in those woods that defied explanation, things we weren't meant to understand. I drove back to the city, exhausted and still in shock. Mike met me at the office, his expression grim. Hell of a day, Bishop. What now? I shrugged. We move on to the next case. Missing persons don't find themselves. Mike nodded, and we both knew the truth. Whatever happened in those woods would stay there, a dark secret we carried with us. There was no time for reflection, no room for fear, just the job, day in and day out. And so, we kept searching, always aware that some cases would never be fully closed, some answers never found. The world was a strange place, and it was our job to navigate it, one missing person at a time.